And we are live in three, two, one. Welcome to Becoming Alpha Podcast. Woo! I'm, <laughs> I'm sitting here with Megan Stark herself, uh, web developer, graphic designer, owner of Great Lake Supply Co. How are you doing, Megan? I'm doing excellent on this fine, sunny afternoon. A uh, beautiful and wonderful day. And yeah, we rode our arrived. bikes here to the garage where we fix our stuff. Out here in my garage for knowledge. Right. So why don't you elaborate? What do you, what do, you do exactly? I do a lot of things. Um, I guess I'm definitely just like fascinated by digital media and making things in that sphere. So that ends up being most often I do web development. I do mostly front end and that involves like HTML, CSS, and then a lot of different like content management systems and platforms and linking those to, to other systems. That's where kind of the bulk of if we're talking like income, that's where a lot of that comes from. But I've really diversified what I do online and it's involved self-portrait photography. It's involved um, YouTube videos. I do, I studied graphic design in college and I still continue to do tons of graphic design and most often for myself. So that's extra fun. And that's where Great Lake Supply Co. comes in. Mm -hmm. It's like a passion project turned people are really into this and I get to just make fun, quirky, well, not really quirky, but like I like to make my designs a little bit clever. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's kind of just good design. And yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm leaving out. <laughs> it's yeah, mostly visual. quite a lot. Yeah. So when did you know that you wanted to get into graphic design? Was it in high school or college? Well, I, what's kind of funny, uh, and I don't think I've ever talked about this online before, but when I was a kid, I always, like, I liked to draw a lot, even though I never really, I, I was like a doodler. I liked to doodle. Mm -hmm. I didn't really get into, like, illustration or into, and I never really got strong at drawing, which is kind of funny, but I just like to do it, and I like to make little, like, newspapers. So I would make the newspaper comics, like, mm -hmm. my own, and I would, like, try to do it in all these different styles, and I would make, like, five different comics on like an 11 by 17 or whatever size computer paper. And then I would like give it to my parents to read. So I don't know how long I did that, but I did that a handful of times. And mm -hmm. I would make little comics and notebooks. I literally always had notebooks on me. So mm -hmm. I think that it's it was something that was there from a very young age. I always liked making things, being creative, like mm -hmm. taking my thoughts and getting them on paper or in like tangible reality. So and do you still do that on paper or did it transfer over to the PC now? It definitely got digital. I draw far less than mm -hmm. I used to, but I still continue to write. So I think for me, it kind of divided up. Like I use technology to like kind of compensate for my like shortcomings when it came to like drawing and um, like boost my ability. And then when it came to, I just like saved, you know, notebooks for, for words. I've always like enjoyed the interaction between like words and symbols. And that's like mm -hmm. the perfect recipe for being a graphic designer. Sure. So when did you know that you had this talent? Um, I don't know. I think it was always an interest mm -hmm. and I don't know when it became apparent that I was especially like gifted at it because I think actually, I suppose during grade school, it was funny. Um, I always had to do things like a little bit differently. And mm -hmm. we had this project. The rebel we, child. Yeah, a little bit of a little bit of a nonconformist. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, not not too rabble rousing, but like just enough to to keep things interesting and to to branch out. So we had to do some project where we were like making a movie poster and we were like, I don't know what the uh academic <laughs> um benefit of this was supposed to be, but we were supposed to make um a movie poster. Uh, recasting the Christmas Carol, like mm. with like contemporary actors for some reason. And everyone else got those giant poster boards that you can get at Walgreens and they like cut out little pictures of Orlando Bloom. Well, I did Orlando <laughs> I basically just recast it as Lord of the Rings, to be honest. <laughs> um, but uh, everyone else like cut out things from magazines and pasted them on these boards. And I pulled up Photoshop when I was in like I don't know, probably like fifth or sixth grade or something. Mm -hmm. And I made like a movie poster in Photoshop. Hmm. But the funny thing is, is 
it would have turned out epic, but I didn't know about large format printing and my parents didn't have like a giant printer. So mine was like this big because we could only print it on maximum like 11 by 17. So it was really funny that like parent teacher conferences where we were sitting down and the teacher was like, obviously Megan didn't follow directions. And my <laughs> parents were like completely unbothered because I'm sure they were like, these kids were using glue sticks and she was yeah. using Photoshop. Like, <laughs> Hell yeah, you try it. You put forth yeah. the effort. That's what they don't get yeah. in grade school and high school. Yeah, How and that's like a different. good kind of failing. It's like, oh, I exactly. made this very cool thing, but I just didn't know that last little detail about large print, like large format printing. And that could have been like a great little lesson at Kinko's or something. Yeah. And really useful information because that's what tons of businesses need, large mm -hmm. format printing and... I did a little poster printing in college as well. I worked at the library where they would do like, it's like the technology portion of the library. I was like a tech librarian, like as nerdy as a librarian could get. <laughs> and we did some poster printing and I was just like, man, I could have used this uh, in grade school. Mm -hmm. So we are sitting on our bikes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you haven't have addressed the, that at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you hadn't seen, we are sitting on our bikes. Um, this is, I would say how I met you was basically because of motorcycles. Yeah. Or, Almost um, everyone I hang out with now, yeah. at least some way is connected to the motorcycle community. Mm -hmm. So I've, ever since I've known you, I've had this, the 03 CBR 600 RR. You're sitting on the Ducati. Yeah. Why the Ducati give, uh, Scrambler Cafe Racer. Ooh. 2017, first year they made it. And you bought that brand new, didn't you? I did. Hell um, Yeah. I knew I had to jump on it. And you know what? They don't make them like this anymore. They look different. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, rumor has it that Ducati makes them in Italy the first year. And after that, they like make them elsewhere. So, so this know. is from Italy? Yeah. This is. Oh, imported Ducati straight from, from Italy? Italy. For yeah. You? This, my mom always says it took the slow boat in because I had to buy it before there were any like here. Yeah. There were, it, it was a hot commodity when I, when I picked one up. I went to Chicago to get it for that reason because they were sold out. I think each mm. dealership only had three. So I was like, got to get her. So why would you choose this bike? Um, there are a lot of things that drew me to this bike. Uh, the styling is amazing. That's mm -hmm. definitely the first thing I noticed about it. But after test riding these scramblers, I love that it's like a lightweight bike. Um, it's only about 400 pounds. It's got that retro look, but the performance of a modern bike. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to like, there's no like corners cut with this bike. And this was my second bike ever. And so this is like an 803cc engine. And that's like plenty of punch for me with room to grow. And I just think like it was like one of those perfect all around bikes. Mm -hmm. Most of my riding is in the city. So these handlebars were perfectly comfortable for that. And the handling is amazing. I love that from the moment I first test rode them. So from a business standpoint, why did you get the bike? Oh, yeah, that's so true. I pulled one of those you know, not what will this cost me, but how can this make me money? And that's and, very smart. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, this is the biggest purchase I've ever made in my life. This is mm -hmm. the nicest thing I own. And I didn't want to take that lightly. I could have, you know, it maybe would have been more responsible to get uh, a cheaper bike or even like a used bike or an older bike. But um, I knew that there was a lot of buzz around these bikes. And I knew that... Um, the Scrambler branding was really strong and that the interest in it was really strong. And the funny thing about it is like, I'm, I kind of like anticipated the fact that this bike would be a bit important. Like they even featured it in Venom. And I want to say there's like, I'm trying to think of other movies, but I know like the, the Ducati Scrambler lineup has been featured in a lot of movies. And that's mm -hmm. how a lot of people found me in my first YouTube videos about this bike. They mm. were Googling Tom Hardy motorcycle, Venom motorcycle, and they were finding me on my Scrambler. Sure. Yeah. So you didn't have the YouTube page before you had the Ducati, correct? Uh, no, I had the Ducati first. I bought it in June of 20, 20, well, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it's mm -hmm. a 2017 bike, so I must have gotten it in 2017. <laughs> <laughs> we could only assume. Yeah, I got it in June of 2017. I had it, I must have had it for a year then, because I think the first YouTube video I posted was in August of 2018. So, mm. yeah, I I got accustomed to the bike and got to enjoy it and mm -hmm. um, spend, spend a decent amount of time with it before I started making content. Sure. I did a lot of self-portraits beforehand, though. It made a lot of appearances on With Instagram. the bike. Yeah, yeah. So that's how it started was the self-portraits. 
and then people responded to it and you kind of went to YouTube. Yeah. Well, you know what? The bike like gave me a reason to post content, I think, because sure. before that was like the pivotal point when I decided to not use my Instagram page as a personal page any longer before it was um, my life, people in it, travel photos, mostly like travel photos. Um, I've always been interested in photography and have always had a passion for it. Mm -hmm. I um, took a couple of photography courses in college. So I had this DSLR camera, but I would just, you know, shoot photos while I traveled. And I was always an avid traveler. I like there was a time when I was traveling like every month or twice a month, sometimes going to like New York one week and and like Texas another week. But um, the bike made it like I could have adventures at home. You know, I yeah. think that was one of the, the biggest things. It's like a little adventure catalyst. Mm -hmm. So take me through the timeline. How? Yeah. Uh, how did it start with um, getting the bike and then transitioning to Instagram and then YouTube? And what was the challenges? Was it because of the popularity or did you get how did you pick up traction? Yeah, well, it's funny because I had started riding in 2016 mm -hmm. in like April 2016, I think, was when I took the riding course because okay. I'd been riding dirt bikes occasionally before then. And my brother, uh, he'd been riding his Ducati. Like, we were on the same timeline. It was, like, three years after college. Or was it three years after? No, I guess it was just one year after college. He's three years older than me. Mm -hmm. One year after college, he got his first bike. It was a Honda. One year after college, I got my first bike, which was a Honda. Uh -huh. And then next season, we got our Ducatis. <laughs> and so we're just, like, kind of following the same timeline. Not on purpose, but it just kind of happened that way. Mm -hmm. um, and when I first got the Honda Rebel, I didn't really post about it online. Yeah. Um, I posted a photo of my mom on the bike before I posted myself. I think mm. it was kind of just like, I, you know, I did it for my own enjoyment. Sure. <laughs> and um, it was just, uh, I think I didn't really start posting photos of it until I was getting, I was getting rid of it. I took, I had a, like a lucky little photo shoot with it right before I sold it. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad I have those photos because it was in front of this mural of this place, Fazio's, which is like a kind of iconic auto mechanic shop that's now oh, gone yeah. and they painted over the murals they're totally gone so i have like was that on uh national it's on farwell yeah oh it's, it's like i know what you're talking yeah about. it's on like farwell and windsor mm -hmm. so now it's now it's totally gone but that's sad um yeah i'm i'm trying to remember now i think i was just uh messing around one day i brought my dslr camera out with me like on purpose to shoot photos mm -hmm. and i don't know what first like I, I actually, now that I think about it, I had taken some self-portraits, travel portraits um, before having the bike. So I had done it before and mm -hmm. I'd done it like, you know, what's the difference between a selfie and a self-portrait? We can kind of get into like the artistic merit of it all. But And what's your definition? Um, I almost feel like it's a self-portrait if you're not holding the camera. <laughs> <laughs> but well, you can be more stylistic, too, with the self-portraits. Yeah, yeah. There's um, The self-portraits are to me, like a method of storytelling. Mm -hmm. I can really um, like set a scene or I can kind of communicate more. A selfie is just like, this is my face today. And a self-portrait, it like becomes not really about me. I think that's what I really enjoy about it. Mm. Um, and one like really practical aspect of it is it's easier to shoot self-portraits with the bike because I can just focus the camera on the bike mm -hmm. and then run over to it. It was so hard to focus self-portraits when you don't have ah. a focus point. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, the first round that I did, it was like so seamless. It took like 15, 20 minutes and they were bangers. Yeah. They were amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, here's my struggle. It was perfect from the go. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, um, I mean, I've definitely had some portrait sessions. I'm like, ah, that didn't work out so well. But usually it's really natural. And I think that's what I enjoy about it. Mm -hmm. It's this kind of problem solving because you're like, okay, I have this scene. How do I break down the scene in an interesting way? How do I insert myself into it? And how do I frame it out without being there? I have to be in two places at once. Yeah. Sometimes I do do portraits uh, without the bike at all. And it's um, now it's a little bit more of an intuitive process. But mm -hmm. I think it's a really it's a really cool kind of craft. And there's there's a lot of communities of people out there. I think the reason the self-portrait even occurred to me was the fact that, like, I've got this background in design and I functionally went to art school. I studied graphic design at UW-Madison, um, and that required a lot of foundational art courses. So mm -hmm. the kind of, uh, like, 
painterly concept of self-portrait was already top of the dome. <laughs> is it a skill that you had to acquire? I know you said yeah. that you perfected it from the yeah. beginning, but like, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you're just tooting your horn a little bit. I feel like yeah. it must have gotten better. Yeah. I'll say that having having shot photos of other people for a long time before then mm -hmm. gave me the skill. So it wasn't that like, boom, first time picking up a camera, good at composition. It's this background in design informed how I like see the world, how I see proportions, how I'm kind mm -hmm. of like drawn to color or texture. And then the kind of final element in this thing that made it extra interesting because, you know, I, I'd, I'd posted my own personal photography and I've always enjoyed it, but I've never really gotten like people being like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Or people don't really get excited about it. It was kind of like, Oh cool. You like you went here and mm -hmm. it's, it's not, it's different than vacation photos. It's not like here's me in front of the Eiffel tower. Um, it was still kind of like more street photography. I really enjoy a lot of, uh, street photographers work and, and I really like high fashion photography. So it was cool mm -hmm. that we could be like fashion in the street mm -hmm. and combine them into one thing. But uh, a lot of the self-portrait photography is kind of analyzing the scene. Once you get like a good sense of how you could approach the area you're working with, and it's cool because it's like a little new problem every time. I try not to tailor it too much. I don't really, I do it a little bit more documentary style than I do fantastical, if that makes sense. It's oh, mm -hmm. like less editorial, more kind of real life. So do you prefer the self-portraits over having somebody else? Oh, absolutely. I feel, I tend to feel really it's more comfortable. Yeah. Well, and one key thing about a lot of these motorcycle self-portraits is I'm wearing my helmet in mm. most of them and like 80% of them I'm wearing my helmet. And why do you do that? Is there a reason? Um, it feels like a character. I can sure. get kind of, uh, experimental with the way I pose and stuff. Cause it feels mm. like I'm like an action figure kind of. Do you get better feedback? Um, I think it's a mixed bag. I think people really enjoy both. There's a okay. cool anonymity. So I think people can kind of like feel a bit more connected to it mm -hmm. when like it's a faceless, our faceless hero. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, um, it also just like looks really cool. I mean, mm -hmm. look at like this helmet. It's just like really cool looking. <laughs> oh yeah. I felt like Master Chief. That's I've always liked the the iridescent face shields because mm -hmm. it always reminded me of like playing Halo with my brother. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. So, when did uh, Great Lakes to Pie Co. start then? Well, funnily enough, I know we were talking about the timeline, but I never really <laughs> got it in the right order. No, we I don't even know my own timeline. I should like pull out. Uh, like a calendar, but Great Lake Supply Co. came first. What was um, the first thing that you did to start it? The first thing, I was just kind of like hanging out in my office and I was realizing that, you know, most of my days were web development and I really mm -hmm. like web development, but it's, I like variety and I'm always going to want to do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I, any kind of graphic design work that I was doing for clients was very uh, corporate. It was very corporate. I wasn't having to do any branding or identity and I wasn't having to do anything particularly like uh, that like spoke to me in that kind of way. So did you not have like a proper creative outlet, would you say? Um, I think I've always had creative outlets, but mm -hmm. I think I just had some ideas knocking around because this bike, it's so inspiring, endlessly inspiring. <laughs> had the bike and then this whole cafe racer culture like blew open for me. Mm -hmm. It is a subset in itself. And that is one like beautiful thing about all this is, you know, motorcycling is this amazing niche. And within it, there's all sorts of other niches. And I was really finding a home in the cafe racer subset. And this whole like coffee and motorcycles thing really spoke to me. I like ever since I was a kid, I always wanted to like own and operate a coffee shop or be a barista. And at the time, actually, I was um, being a barista because I was working all the time, doing contract work remotely. Mm -hmm. And I was back in Milwaukee after graduating from Madison and just kind of like big transitional moment, not really like connecting with new people, not really having things in common with old friends. And so I started working at a cafe and that was like a fantastic environment for meeting new people and being re-energized, but feeling like productive still because I was in this like puritanical work ethic mode of I couldn't possibly just have a hobby. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and we can see that in some of your designs too. Yeah, the coffee. Is that influence? where the coffee? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it. I've always like enjoyed coffee, but it was cool to like learn a lot more about 
espresso and how to like pull shots. And I've lost a lot of my barista knowledge, but I got like barista trained by Valentine Coffee Co., which is a local roaster. Mm -hmm. And the it just kind of like bolstered my coffee interest even more. And I was like, well, this is like rife for fun designs, like coffee and motorcycles. There, there are some companies that capitalize on it, like Ace Cafe, but they've got a very like singular kind of style. I wanted to kind of, it's almost the feminine touch, you know, like mm-hmm. a, a little bit of my spin on it and having this background in branding identity and like a really rigorous graphic design training in Madison um, gave me this kind of other lens to look at it. So, and because I love wordplay, because I love uh, how like, words and images interact with one another, the whole cafe racer thing just blew up into these other designs. So the first one that I actually came up with was one that's like the least popular, I'd arguably say. And it's the whole like latte art helmet. You weren't perfect on the first one? No, not this time. (laughs) Oh man, and and those designs were hard. There were a couple that I completely had to pitch. Um, I had thought, oh, it'd be cute to have like a motorcycle riding around like the rim of a cup. Mm -hmm. And I just like did not have the skill to execute it. That would be great as an illustration. Yeah, I'm sure someone who illustrates would be able to like kill that, knock it out of the park, go ahead and make that. (laughs) Um, But as a kind of, a a lot of my designs are very like logo-like. They could almost all be logos on by themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of just like how my brain worked. It was like making a little set of icons and symbols. So Mm -hmm. The one that was really the piece de resistance of the first batch was the go naked one. Although mm-hmm. a lot of people like the cafe racer one, that's there's latte art in a spade. And it's abstract enough that if you haven't really, if you don't really look at latte art or you don't recognize it, it looks like this abstract shape, but that's what it is. Um, and that one was like kind of a mind bending thing because I wanted to make this spade that had like a rounded bottom mm-hmm. and executing that was actually like really really difficult and you don't really see them around a lot for a reason because somehow I, I keep making designs that require a lot of science like even the design that that i'm wearing and you're wearing the watch for cycles design which is like one of the new ones um the takes a lot of mathematical thinking to get all the proportions right and mm-hmm. to to get it to work i can see yeah so how did you get the inspiration for this if the this other one, one was coffee yeah this doesn't seem like a very coffee. Yeah, we're in a new movement. This round is a little bit more inspired by motorcycle visibility and like the zen of riding. I wanted to combine because to me, motorcycling has always been this like meditative experience. It's always been more than just the bike. It's if anything, the bike is just like a catalyst for the sensation, mm. for the feeling that you get while riding. Um, and there's nothing quite like it. So it's, I like to go after more of the feeling than like the technical stuff. And I think anyone who like consumes my content, like it's a vibe, like it's just, it's feel good stuff. I want to either inform or entertain in just like a wholesome way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the, this collection definitely is evocative of that. Like first it was, um, it was the, you know, cafe racer vibe and the naked bike vibe which is, you know, the bike's stripped down without any fairings. It's aesthetic. And this time around, I wanted to to open the floodgates, but also still be narrow enough to be, you know, uh, not for every single person. But the Mm -hmm. watch for cycles thing is pretty cool because it applies to bicyclists as well, any kind of cycling. Why don't you take me through, um, like, WooCommerce? How did you (laughs) choose WooCommerce? How did you choose your e-commerce site and like why oh yeah well you know what's funny is my bread and butter is is e-commerce and i've spent the past mm, maybe like six five or six years doing e-commerce mm-hmm. and it's actually in in terms of web development it's the thing that i really enjoy doing the most it's so fun because you can like see immediately the return on investment for the client so that's really great it's like mm-hmm. um And there's a lot of room to like solve problems for people. There's a lot of room to optimize. And then on the back end to integrate with their accounting software solutions and just like deliver a lot of value. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to sell people on (laughs) e-commerce. No, it's not. 
But I learned a platform that was developed by Adobe that they phased out. And I like fell in love with this platform. It was really great. It was like a closed source version of WordPress. It was a content management system, but they phased it out. And I was just like sad. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to have to figure out other solutions. So it, but it, it made me kind of open my mind to trying out a lot of different platforms for my own, um, first site. I used like a shopping cart plugin that actually still after now trying all these different platforms and there's some things I do for clients and there's some things I advise more for like small, medium business versus small or versus like more enterprise clients. Mm -hmm. And this like Equid plugin is awesome. So I'm kind of like sad to move away from it, but it had its limitations. Mm -hmm. So I'm moving to WooCommerce myself because of just like the ultimate flexibility of like all these different like shipping options and different uh like product variations and inventory there's like a lot of functionality that works with woocommerce that you couldn't scale up in other platforms mm -hmm. um and a lot for my own clients i tend to put them on shopify mm -hmm. it's funny like how deep do we want to get in this because yeah, I have, i'm sure you can go deep i have reasons for woocommerce versus shopify sure that are for me but not for my clients <laughs> and what are the top reasons what would um, you what would you say are the top reasons for that the top reason for choosing one or the other um it's because i have another stream of income that's outside of just e-commerce sales that mm. i get from uh platforms so i'm really passionate about like teaching people how to make money and stuff yeah. and uh, I love talking about like affiliate marketing and mm -hmm. all the different little ways people can make money online. Cause a lot of people think it's kind of a ruse. They think like you couldn't possibly make money online, but I've never had a traditional job. Mm -hmm. Um, at least I had like internship kind of things, but I never had full time nine to five have to be here like X amount of time for X number of days. Like even when I had, um, kind of consistent jobs in college, they, I managed to like finagle my own flexibility. I was just like, always had control over my time. And so I'm always learning new ways to make money. And one big one is like credit card processing. You don't have to stick with like PayPal and Stripe and all these processors that charge a lot, basically for convenience or because mm. they, um, they charge a flat rate for all cards. Um, and that's, they charge a higher rate because they're anticipating rewards cards. And you can like run credit card reports, see how much money you actually should be charged for these kinds of transactions and like negotiate a lower rate. So that's what I that's do for myself and I do for my clients is I put them on different credit card processors that save them like hundreds of dollars a month mm -hmm. because it's a variable rate. It's not, you know, the 30 cents plus 2.9% transaction rate. So the long and involved reason why I'm on WooCommerce instead of on Shopify is Shopify charges you extra if you don't use their payment gateway. So it's like, you gotta decide. I so I was kind of banking on my own success. I figured I could use Shopify, maybe develop it faster. I would get um, commissions on being my own, like on hosting. Mm -hmm. That's pretty nominal. But then they would, I would use their credit card processor. Or I could be on my own platform that I fully had control over. And I would be like having a more competitive credit card processing rate. And then I myself, get a kickback on that. So there's yeah. like so many layers to software and how you can make money. And it's great because everyone wins. Like mm -hmm. even when someone gets a commission, it doesn't hurt the client. It just is the like finder's fee or the it's built into the price mm -hmm. for for so, like salespeople to get commissions and for everyone to benefit from that. So how do you tie in affiliate marketing with your Instagram and your logos and everything? Yeah, affiliate marketing is, is tough on Instagram because they don't let you like hyperlink things. And yeah. you have to have 10K followers in order to do any swipe up stuff. So you use Instagram to get them to your website? Yeah, pretty much. Well, Instagram, it's like, um, yeah, it's another uh, funnel, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to treat it just like that because I also just like to have fun and connect with people on there. I think that's where like it's a kind of intimate subset of people to talk to through Instagram. I've made amazing connections. I mean, we know each other basically because of motorcycles and Instagram. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to only treat it like this, like means to an end. Um, and it's like a fun creative space because I've like found a use for these self portraits that are like 
just like an interesting way of like self-expression, but more so I think it's like beyond self-expression because I don't do it to like share a feeling like this is how I feel today. It's like, I don't know, this is like, it's like little exercises in design that try to like keep me sharp. Mm -hmm. But um, most of my uh, affiliate commissions and like revenue coming from there comes from YouTube because I can link up in the description hey, this is the microphone I use. This is the uh, camera I use. This is the GoPro mount I use. And if people purchase that through Amazon, I get a small commission on that. And they slice the rates during the pandemic. So it certainly shouldn't be like a primary source of income, Mm -hmm. but it's a nice little perk here and there that, and there's like, Amazon is just one of very many affiliate programs and Mm -hmm. you can go directly to different like suppliers and different, uh, different stores and they have affiliate programs. It's a, it's a cool rabbit hole to go down, but Mm -hmm. it's definitely one of those things where you have to have the audience first, you have to have people to market to, and then you can expect like a really good day would be like 8% conversion rate. So it ends up being a numbers game. Mm. Yeah. So what's your plan moving forward? You got any <laughs> anything big in the works or anything you want to do? Anything you see in the market? Oh, yeah. I do have like a lot of I have things that are happening now. And then I do have some like kind of wish list things that I know can happen, but I don't want to have too much on my plate at once because I like to finish things. I don't I don't mm-hmm. want to be all ideas and no execution. So the biggest thing coming up is I've got a new website coming out. Um And I'm building it out to be more of a community tool. Like Mm -hmm. it's cool to sell things, but I don't want to just be shilling things to people online. And especially since like tenets of minimalism are important to me, I want to add value outside of objects. Um, And obviously the content contributes to that. It's entertainment, it's fun, it's informative. But then I want the website to be um, a destination. So I'm doing more blog posts, kind of one of the first ones I'm talking about, or I'm talking about like, what is a naked bike and a little bit of the history of naked bikes and like when did like it kind of splinter into like retro and street uh street fighter kind of style so people who are curious about that hopefully will find my site through that Mm -hmm. and just like doing more like community building stuff and and i'm thinking like who knows i could have like forums on there but One thing, too, is I want to feature local builders. And so the Mm. website will be a destination to kind of see, like, what's the Milwaukee scene or the Midwest What do you mean builders? Uh, People who build motorcycles or Ah. just makers in general. I've got a series on my channel called Milwaukee Makers. Mm -hmm. And it's titled vaguely enough that I'm looking forward to maybe visiting leather workers, people who do... Um, woodworking, all sorts of other kinds of makers, because that's just, I've always just been attracted to that. That's something that I do is make things. Most of my things are digital and I just love people who make real life things. And I like being around that and uh, showcase. Awesome. So wrapping this up, what would you say is the biggest challenge that you have faced um, building everything that you've built and also a reward. What have what have you gotten out of this that you hadn't expected? Well, um, it, things end up always working out because um, I can be my own like guinea pig mm-hmm. for my. I like being my own trial uh, experiment before I do things for clients. And I had a uh, a prospect come up to me. I know maybe a year and a half ago, and he asked me if I had ever built something from the ground up. He says, mm-hmm. "I see you work with a lot of like." established businesses because that's oftentimes when someone brings in a web developer is because they you know need to outsource that they don't have someone in-house or they're growing to a certain scale they need more complex things accomplished so i really liked that he asked that and i was already in the middle of doing all this great like supply co stuff because i'm like yeah i'm in the midst of building something Mm -hmm. and the empathy that you can have with clients (laughs) from building something from the ground up and not kind of just uh, you know, jumping into an existing business or, or um, yeah, being a part of a, yeah. an already well-oiled machine. There's something about like the grittiness. Yeah. You're growing and, together in a way. Yeah. And then you, they know you can, they know where you've been and you know a specific set of struggles and mm-hmm. how to kind of do everything. So I've always been someone who's liked to learn and like to solve problems. And 
it's great that I can do that for myself and then bring that information out where it's, it's even if this completely got messed up, I didn't make any money. I've learned like all these new platforms that I might not have. I learned how to like integrate solutions that I might not have. And there was no pressure of, oh my gosh, if I don't deliver for this client, like everything's going to explode or like, you know, I'm only wasting my own time and it's Mm -hmm. never a waste of time because I'm always learning something. Uh, You know, any kind of designs that I make that don't really make the cut, there were designs for this batch that didn't make the cut. And I'm like, okay, that's just like practice. And I think that is definitely um, one of the good things that have come out of this. Sure. So how did you start your YouTube channel? What was your intentions when you started your YouTube channel? And how did you build the base audience? Okay. Well, what's interesting is a lot of people assume like a YouTube channel gets popping because people came in droves from another platform. And by the time I started the YouTube channel, I think I had, I don't know, like 2000 followers on Instagram or something. And like 10 people came over from that. Hmm. People didn't, didn't care. Maybe I think on the top end, maybe 300 people came over. So it was completely like starting from the ground up, new platform, basically zero interest. Um, Instagram's a visual platform, but it's little snippets and people really have to care to want to watch any more than five seconds of video of you. So mm-hmm. what I had done was I had an actual very specific strategy for this. And this is something that business owners should think about because this is something that I did in a, like a little content strategy packet for a client of mine. But I made the videos. <laughs> um, the first one and the one that's like done the best and has gotten like, I'd argue, viral success because it has now over 200,000 views. And I it was like the second or third video I ever made. And I still mm. have I have around 10,000 YouTube subscribers. So that is like very viral. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I had done was I did a walk around, walk around tour of the bike. So this bike has a specific mod that you can make to it that people aren't really talking about or they weren't at the time. This was two years ago. And it requires an extra part that you had to like, I only knew about it all because I was talking to a supplier who made like parts for the bike. And that's like niche levels of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to share how I did the mod, the kind of handful of things I did to the bike to improve it. It was a little bit informational. It had a little bit of my personality in it. I was just like being myself. And you could tell that I was going to be making more. So in this one video, it captured a lot of people because they were, they got the information. They got a sense that I wasn't just some faceless person. I could have made like a slideshow and put just descriptions, but Mm -hmm. I made a point of showing my face in the beginning and being an active voice in person while I was doing the little tour of the bike. Mm -hmm. But what really um, gave it traction was distribution. You can keyword all day long in YouTube and you can push it on Instagram or whatever, but that's only going to do so much. And what really got the video traction was I went to um, Ducati Scrambler forums where people were chatting about customizing the bikes and I posted my video. So you get source you get traffic from an outside source in really long watch time because people are interested in that it's not a bunch of um bounces uh youtube sees that as like lower value hits Mm -hmm. if you can't get someone to stay why would they promote your video so i was getting traffic that was like sustained people watching 80 percent of the video i'm just like riffing on the numbers so that told youtube this is a watchable video people are interested in it and then (laughs) the kicker was I had great timing because I made the video in August and then Venom came out in October or I think maybe September Mm -hmm. and everyone was looking up the Ducati Scrambler and I'm over here with my custom Ducati Scrambler and the thumbnail was great. (laughs) You could see me in the thumbnail like, oh, it's a chick in a bike. You just see the top of the bike. Don't know what else is different about it. Mm -hmm. And it was like nice and simple. And one thing that I always strive to do, a lot of people try to play this like clickbait game. But when you're kind of trying to like deliver value and not just do like spectacle stuff, if you're trying to be informative or basically deliver on your promises, just make things as matter of fact as, oops, sorry, (laughs) things as matter of fact as possible. The title wasn't anything crazy. It was like a walk around tour of my custom Ducati scrambler. Like Hmm. 
the description, like everything that happened in it was what you were expecting. And I think people find that refreshing because they're always being misled online. So especially if you want to kind of operate in a more professional way online, that's the way to do it. Well, you know, what's mm -hmm. interesting. Um, I was watching this podcast the other day and the guy's channel is mostly him like finding uh, like scammers online or like um, basically he like uh you know, there's like gurus and stuff. So he, yeah. he's like fact checking gurus basically, but he's not trying to all be doom and gloom all the time. He wants people to be like critically like absorbing media. But then he started a podcast where it's called real jobs. And it's like, why you should be a plumber, why you should like the benefits of learning like a trade or like a skill, a hard skill. And then how people find success in that, because mm. he's trying to, provide an alternative for the get rich quick scheme, like an actual fulfilling thing. So it's like doing a little bit of the maybe uh, commentary, but then offering an alternative. And I think those don't get as many views, but it is really like powerful information. And for the core fan base, kind of have to do a little bit of one for me, one for you. Like he does this, you know, sensational analysis of a buzzy buzzword person or whatever. And then he also you know, caters to the people who are over there, who are there kind of like for him at that point. Yeah, aren't you sick of that? I'm so sick of that. All these people online that you see, it's just like, Everything's I want a skill set. I want to learn something. Yeah. I don't want, I want to be, I want to have value, you know? Yeah. I don't want somebody to just hand me something, you know? It's it, like, it's, it's like disingenuous and it's just, like, why would, yeah, why would you want that? Why would you want, it's like, cause then what do you do? Like, if you really did like execute on that, like, oh my gosh, I got rich quick. Like now what? Like your life is just meaningless. Or a lot of times they're like, yeah. you have to sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You're like mm -hmm. burn bridges, have no relationships, like, yeah. emo like emotionally enriching, like with people or business wise enriching. And then at the end of the day, I mean, that's the thing is like, if you're just adding value, like the people will come and I've never really mm -hmm. had even with that video, it went viral, but it wasn't like nothing stuck as this big, like overnight success. It's always been a yeah. slow roll with me because I'm kind of just like that kind of presence. Like yeah. I can't scream on camera. I can't yeah. like do all this crazy stuff. Yeah. I well, <laughs> there is always the 1%. The 1% gets lucky and there's always yeah. going to be that 1% that gets lucky, but it's about the consistency. And like you said, just yeah. keeping, keeping it simple, keeping it easy to read. You, you know what you're getting and then yeah. just staying consistent with it. And there's like a, there's a distribution where it's like, it's exponential. Yeah. So you start and it's, it's going yeah. to dip, but as long as you keep going, it's exponential and it raises and raises. And as long as you don't quit. That's what I'm finding lately. There's, there's a couple of things about um, capturing people and like having like real followers and people who care and not just like random people coming in for the spectacle, seeing like what crazy thing you're doing today or how you're embarrassing yourself or how you're embarrassing somebody else. But um Getting to the point where you're bingeable, I think a lot of people, they want to make like mm. five videos and be like, oh, it's not working. Like I got mm -hmm. bail or like this isn't this isn't the thing for me. Or one thing really catches like I had I haven't been able to replicate the success of the perfectly timed, you know, Venom movie release and all this yeah. other stuff. And that didn't really give me like it wasn't. I mean, I've never really been someone who viscerally reacts to like numbers on a screen like that. I'm just like, huh, interesting. Like that has a lot of views now. There's a, I'm flooded with comments, mm -hmm. but it wasn't people, you know, the people who scream the loudest in the viral moments are the people who don't really stick around for later. They're not that, you know, ultimately if you're running a business, you're trying to convert sales. So people are just swooping in and being like, oh, you're hot and then disappearing those aren't really people who you even need to keep. So mm -mm. to what end do you even want virality? You really just want to reach the people who you can help the most. You've been reading Dan's comments. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what we're always struggling with. Is Brandon too is just like, we gotta, we gotta be screaming in our videos uh, and energetic. And no, like, I don't say screaming. We just can't be, uh, you yeah. know, like sometimes yeah. I find we're Some uh, people, we, we open a video and well, it's, it's like, it's, they're just it's, like, oh, you're doing great, Dan and uh, I. What, yeah, I'm just saying like, is, what I'm saying is, when Dan and I converge with one another, when we converge with you, we have this yeah. level, of like this is who we are. Yeah. And when we're on camera, it's like all of a sudden we just become mm -hmm. a shell of that. And, yeah. and that doesn't show, and it's like, meeting where we are as opposed, not being inauthentic, yeah, but, be yeah. but we're like, not, we don't, I feel like I'm not as authentic as I am with my friends and family. Yeah, yeah. there's like calculated vulnerability. I, I struggle with that a lot because I think I'm not nearly, I think I'm, <laughs> 
I think I'm way more fun in person than I am in videos. Like in videos, people are just like, wow, you're I'm chill the same as well. way. Same way. Yeah. She's <laughs> making fun of me with my arms. We're She's like, like, what are you doing with your arms? I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. So when we started, like I don't know versions. if you noticed, when we started, I started like laughing really hard um, when we started this. And I was just, because we were like, yeah, yeah. Because I was like trying to amp down up. We're like, let's get the energy, energy up, guys. And then I started thinking like, what if it was like, a sketch where I'm like, all right, Dan, come on, more energy, more energy. Like, and Dan's me, like, oh, shit, and Dan's so pretty soon, but it's like, oh, yeah. you know, it just like keeps building up. It's like, just I slowly. mean, but like, how do you not think about the fact that there's a camera observing you? Like, you, yeah. unless they're around all yeah. the time, which is bad for you psychologically, it's like, what's the balance yeah. of being real? And you gotta be like, oh, I, yeah. I, we're trying to think of it as like I a never. confidence thing, or like, yeah. a, you have to keep doing it or a consistency thing. The more consistent you are on camera, the more consistent you are talking to people, the I better more you're gonna get at it. More as, uh, more as not being inauthentic, but being yeah. presentable. So, yeah. so like when you speak in public, you might not be exactly the same, but you wanna you a, a uphold more. a point of confidence and a point of authority in a way of like how you speak to, for, from yourself that, yeah. that makes people wanna listen to you more. There's like a cadence that you have and, and some people have noticed that's like the fun thing about moto vlogs is I can just press play and like not have to think about it. I'm behind mm -hmm. the camera and I sometimes am like talking to the camera, but I like it just being like things are unfolding around me and I'm just like crafting it in the end. And it's nice because I can just be myself. A lot of people notice in the, in the moto vlogs that I'm like higher energy and like a little bit more fun or like cracking jokes or laughing more, but it's also like, well, how am I going to like, and if I'm just in my apartment by myself in dead silence, like what, what am I supposed to be doing? I know. Yeah. I wish you could play music while you're making a video or do something like, mm -hmm. you know, cause when I'm home, I'm just chilling. I'm not this like neurotic energy. I think that's the thing too, is sometimes people are really extroverted on camera because they're like hyperactive or, or a lot of them like slam an energy drink beforehand. Mm. They have this like pre video making ritual and that, that mm. can be really cool. But sometimes I just like, I'm like, whatever, I'll just finesse it in the edit, add some jokes <laughs> and like hope everything's okay. But I think part of it for me, I've like leaned into the fact that there is um, part, like some people like content to relax mm -hmm. and I love ASMR. I don't make ASMR content yet, but this kind of unwinding at the end of the day, like I don't mind if my content's kind of unwinding at the end of the day. Well, I appreciate you coming on, becoming alpha. Megan Stark, everybody, we're going to be linking her um, handles own. down below. In true Becoming Alpha fashion, we do challenge Megan Stark to a self-portrait game. Each of us will have 10 minutes to go out and do their own self-portraits, and you will have to decide whose self-portraits are better. Megan and I are doing a self-portrait challenge. One portrait can be submitted from each of us. You have to also vlog your thoughts about the composition and why you think that that is going to be the winning picture. And then you will choose who the winner is. So I'm using a helmet. That's one foolproof way to basically always get a good shot because you have one less thing to think about. Difficult thing about self-portraits is you gotta like run over there, strike a pose and think about your stupid face. Let's see. Ooh, look, we got, is that ant a naturally occurring antler? Holy shit, I'm gonna use that. You can't use that. <laughs> Holy crap. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, I'm gonna geek on that. Um, oh yeah, set the timer. You always have to do auto timer and then just take, pretty much set it to as many shots as you can take. Mine can only do 10 seconds, three shots, so that's what I'm gonna do. So I'm feeling an action shot here. Okay, this is gonna be this is gonna be sexy. We're gonna use elements of the foreground still, and I'm gonna be on this rock so as I am above you, and I'm going to act as though I am reaching for the heavens. That all you want. Bro. <laughs> we can set a timer. I don't need a timer on that fast.
Here are the final photos. Always remember, stay alpha. I'll do my best. Alpha. <laughs>